call to order the Board of Finance at 6 11 p.m. Um, we have pretty significant agenda. We are hoping to get through tonight, although Chuck Bit is on the consent agenda. Yes. So I would um, uh, basically, if we're watching at home, we have some sort of routine board of finance business, and then we have um, a update on the FY24 budget with a presentation that is going to be led by, by Catherine and I. Um, as, as you know, as we're, we're getting close to the time of uh, handing this over to you and uh, hopefully moving towards passage of the budget for the year. But before we do that, we do have uh, eight delivered items in the consent agenda. I welcome a motion um, to adopt the agenda. I would make that motion. Thank you, Councilor McGee. Second. Anyway, President Paul, thank you. Any discussion of the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to vote. All those in favor of adopting the Motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The motion varies unanimously. Um, we now have scheduled a public forum. Is there anyone in the room that would like to speak to the Board of Finance? I am not seeing uh, any takers there. I do see that former City Council Dick Pusher has joined us online and has her hand up. So. Go ahead, Sharon. You should be able to uh, address the board of finance. Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hold on. I have you on. I had you on the phone because I couldn't get in. Um, I wanted to speak about the budget process and then one comment specifically about the um, uh, recommended action or proposed action. Um, at, when you first laid out the agenda, there was going to be a work session for city council. Um, and I, that was all tentative, I realized that. But since I feel that adopting the budget is one of the most important things that elected officials do, um, I, I'm concerned because I've, I zoom in on a regular basis and I don't think every counselor has been able to do that. And so I just wanted to add that statement that I'm, I don't see that now possible. And I think it's a missed opportunity um, for people representing the residents of Burlington to have some input <clears throat> or make comments about it. Um, the second piece has to do with an authority that apparently you, you actually have in the charter to raise the dedicated tax for parks. And I'm not challenging that, um, but I am regretting the fact that um, a tax uh, like this isn't, um, the voters don't really have a chance to weigh in on it. Now there's, you know, there's a, an increase in water and wastewater. There's going to be an increase in Burlington Electric. And now there will be this additional tax. And um, as I stated before, um, there is no, um, in, it, with the schools, um, there is a sliding scale. So to accommodate people that are in low or fixed incomes, but with the municipal taxes, there isn't that option or that relief. And so I'm really concerned about this. Um, I understand that maybe parks needs more dedicated money, but I think that the voters should evaluate that. Um, and I'm just weighing in on that. I urge you not to exercise that authority without getting input from the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I do not see any more, um, any more members of the public with their hands raised. So uh, we are going to close the public forum and we uh, move to item three, which is the consent agenda. And board is ready. I welcome a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Thank you, Councilor Barlow. 
Second by Councilor McGee, discussion of the consent agenda. Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, that brings us now to 4.01. Um, which is the authorization to execute a contract with Fitness and Solid Waste District for 20 years 2024 through 2028 in wastewater biosolids disposal contract. And one of the water team here to assist. I'll be back. Megan Moyer, uh, Division Director, and this is my wastewater facility manager, Matt Dow. Um, I alluded to this in our budget presentation. Um, that our costs for biosolids management are going up. Biosolids is the solid portion of the wastewater that gets separated out as part of our wastewater treatment process. And that has to be managed in some way, whether through disposal or through uh, reuse reuse programs. Um, there was an option in the last contract to seek an extension or an amendment with the existing service provider. Uh, and so CSWD in Burlington looked at that option, looked at the pricing that Casella could offer. And then when we when they compared it against Two other vendors. Basically, the other vendors said lock that price in as soon as you can. Um, and when we look at the rest of the region and we're seeing some of the amazing eye popping cost increases, even though this is a, a significant cost increase, it's still much less than what we're seeing in Maine and other places. And so we are locking it in. It is uh, it is an increase. It is part of the, the some of the, the expense drivers in our FY24 budget, but it is in the FY24 budget um, as proposed. Um, how would the board like to proceed? Are we ready for a motion? Questions? So, um, thanks for the explanation um, and for your advocacy. Um, I'll be happy to make a motion as recommended. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Councilor McGee. Discussion? Seeing no. Hands, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries yes. Thank you. Um, 4.02 is uh, the front electric department FY24 rate change that we discussed in our budget presentation weeks ago. Um, welcome, Darren. I'm not, you know, I recall we spoke fairly extensively about change. I'm not sure it's necessary to. Well, maybe uh, let's see what the board wants to do. How would, the, how would the board like to proceed on this? Obviously, important recommendation. Um, questions for the Councilor McGee. All right. I think it would be helpful for the public just considering this rate change to just have a, at least a brief overview of what we're looking at. Great. Thanks, right. Rick. Go ahead, uh, Emily and Darren. Great. Um, good evening. Uh, Darren Springer, I believe Stephens Willock here from Burlington Electric. Um, I think we can pull up just to resummarize the slides that we presented during the budget presentation. Um, we're seeking your approval to advance to the PUC a 5.5% rate increase for FY24. Um, and we've done a number of things to try to hold uh, our controllable costs down. Um, relative to uh, some of the challenges that we're seeing in the power markets and with transmission, uh, as well as just uh, challenges that everyone's seeing in terms of uh, labor cost increases, inflation, uh, et cetera. This is significantly less than what we believe would be justified under PUC procedure, which would likely be uh, a significant uh, increase, uh, something along the order of 14%. Um, so we're continuing to try to run uh, leaner than what might be justified while trying to maintain the credit rating metrics uh, that Moody's expects of us for an A rating, which is 90 days cash on hand in particular. Uh, this budget with this rate case gets us just to that 90 days, um, as well as the adjusted debt service coverage ratio, uh, which we have improved over the last several years. Uh, we expect that will continue to improve uh, or at least maintain stability uh, through this rate case and this budget. And uh, certainly our goal will be to adjust rates more regularly, but to do so 
uh, at levels that are ideally at the low to mid single digits, not in the high single digits or double digits as we're seeing in other utility service territories. Um, and then just to uh, further summarize from the presentation, our residential rates will remain some of the lowest uh, in Vermont and New England. Um, and uh, our overall rates will also remain uh, very competitive and lower than the averages in New England. And then um, lastly, we will uh, still have the best electric vehicle rate in the state of Vermont, and we will still have our uh, pilot program for the energy assistance, which provides a 12.5% discount to income qualified customers. We'll be looking to make that uh, permanent um, during the course of fiscal year 24. Um, hopefully it's helpful. We'll obviously glad to answer questions. Great. Thank you for that, Darren. How would the board like to proceed? That's me. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, as much we can do with uh, look at rate increases, you know, hopefully that can be a super regular thing, but um, I'm curious if you could provide any updates on the pilot for um, providing assistance for folks, uh, what the uptake of that has been, and if there's still capacity in that, that program. Absolutely. Um, Emily's got the slide right here. Um, we are, I think we're closing in on about 150 customers signed up. Um, we think that we can provide uh, significantly more capacity there uh, to sign up more customers. Um, we've had some discussions recently with CBOEO about their help in getting the word out. Uh, Itameno, our new energy equity analyst, has spent time uh, at different places in the community uh, bringing uh, not only information about the program, but actually uh, computers so that we can sign people up, you know, right as we're speaking with them. And we're working to see what else we can do potentially with our colleagues at Water and elsewhere to have it. So if you sign up for one program, maybe you can get it to both if the criteria are, are identical. Um, so our goal, the pilot was initially an 18 month pilot. And as, as you'll recall, the city supported that initial period with ARPA funds. Our goal is to build this into rates uh, more permanently um, and to have PUC approval for a more permanent program. Uh, which would come up during FY24. And ultimately, we think we can reach the 800 to 1500 residential customer enrollment. Um, we're proactively looking to uh, expand on the kind of slow and steady uptake that we're seeing now. Um, so it'll be an important component. We do see kind of a continued adjustment to rates, hopefully in that lower single digit level, but it may sometimes be in the mid single digits. And having this as a percentage discount makes sure that the benefit of the discount remains significant, even if rates do move up. So thank you for that. It's encouraging to hear that uh, you're talking about receiving departments that as rates are going up kind of across the board, making sure that we're taking care of folks and income sensitizing you know, and everything we can, but I think it's important. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And be happy to make the motion. Thank you, Councilor Wiki. Do we have a second? Thank you, Councilor Barlow. Any further discussion of the motion before we act? See no hands with the vote. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Councilor James. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, Darren, thank you for the presentation. And I was just asking about um over the past three years, what's the percentage total of the rates that have been increased? Yes, so we had uh, seven and a half percent back coming out of the pandemic was our first increase. Um, okay. And then we had a 3.95% uh, last year. And then we're proposing a five and a half percent this year. Um, so we actually have a slide, if we can pull it up, that shows the yeah. trajectory of rates and compares it to inflation over that period, which uh, you know, amazingly and, and challenging, uh, but even with those increases, we're actually still below uh, the trajectory for inflation over that uh, multi-year period. Um, we'll have that up right here on the screen. So you can see the green line there is the BED rate change uh, over that period of time that we just talked about. And the red line is inflation uh, as we've all experienced it. Um, so even though it's a significant amount, certainly relative to a period where we had no rate yes. changes, it's uh, it's still helpful to compare with the inflation rate. 
Yes, yes. No, I, I completely understand. And, you know, my, my point being, you know, before the past three years, almost no rate increases, right? That's correct. And, and it, you know, maybe, you know, decades, no rate increases. But at this level, I think it is increasing in a way that's a little bit uh, becoming sustainable, right? So, for example, let's think about not increase again, bring all the increases right now. Um, so I'm, I'm talking just specifically about the future a little bit. Let's put this in mind into perspective as we move forward as well. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. We will absolutely always do everything we can to avoid coming to you with a rate change. It's the least, uh, it's the least option that we look at uh, after everything else is exhausted. And, uh, we do have some ideas for helping to mitigate uh, future needs. Uh, including uh, increasing our credit line uh, and doing some other things relative to financing. Uh, so we'll be bringing you those during the course of the next fiscal year as well. Okay. All right, I think if there's no further questions, we're ready for vote. All those in favor of motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Darren. I see we got another BD item next up, uh, organizational chart update. We do, and uh, I see Tim Clancy from HR is on with us. Um, uh, we're also joined by Mike Canerick, Paul Alexander, and Munir Kasti. Um, this item in particular, uh, Emily and Munir's areas are both uh, impacted by, and if it's helpful, I'd be happy to summarize briefly the position updates that we're looking to make. We could share, yeah, if we want to share screen, we could do that. Um, I just, maybe I'll preface just by saying, and I know that the board knows this, this has been one of the most challenging times I've, I've experienced in terms of being able to recruit, retain uh, qualified individuals for positions. We're experiencing that. We've had significant vacancies uh, continuing uh, throughout the last year plus. Um, we've been carrying uh, probably between 10 and 13 vacancies, uh, which is much higher than typical for us. So the set of changes here is partly to address uh, some of the needs that we have and partly to address situations where we've been unable to recruit a qualified incumbent uh, to bring into the position. Um, so we start uh, at the top with the engineering. Uh, we've had a position that we've tried, I believe, three times to hire for unsuccessfully, uh, which is a bit of a combined position where the previous uh, person in the position had a unique skill set. Um, it's really a two position position. It's a SCADA engineer, and it's also a director for the grid services, which is essentially the dispatch. And after unsuccessfully trying three times, uh, we are going to try to split this position and bring in two people as opposed to one person. Um, so that's what the first uh, updates, uh, one through three there, are related to. Um, we also uh, have had some change in generation. Uh, Dave McDonnell, who was our director of generation for a number of years, retired previously. And the set of changes here is partly to uh, essentially codify the current structure that we've created after Dave had left. We did not hire for his position. So part of the changes here, number seven in particular, is to convert his position uh, to a senior generation engineer position. We don't necessarily anticipate hiring for that uh, in the immediate future, but we anticipate having that need. Um, we also are planning to have two directors. So two of these updates are related to having a director for plant maintenance and a director for operations. Uh, those are position conversions. So we have two uh, well-qualified individuals in current uh, supervisory positions who we're looking to uh, establish as direct reports to Muneer. Uh, Muneer would be essentially in charge of the generation area, um, as is the case at the moment. And so some of these are, are reporting changes. Um, and then we are looking to add a shift supervisor position. Uh, we are anticipating retirements throughout the organization. One of the proudest things for me is that BED is an organization where when we have employee appreciation, we celebrate 25, 30, 35, 40, and sometimes 45 year anniversaries as we did just uh, this past week. Um, on the other hand, that means that we will have some retirements coming and uh, we're trying to get ahead of that in certain respects with a few of these changes. Uh, to bring in folks now who can start learning from some of our uh, experienced uh, you know, BEDers in the generation area. Uh, again, the idea is not necessarily to sustain that capacity for the long run, but to have it uh, in the near term. And then uh, lastly, in the um, finance and IT area, we had a couple of updates. 
uh, one of which is uh, to create a, uh, another accounting administrator position. Uh, this is one of those things where this is a product of success in a way. Uh, when um, I started at BED, we weren't processing very many uh, rebates for electrification. I don't think we even had the programs yet. Uh, now we're processing uh, dozens, sometimes you know hundreds in a month. Um, and we have a number of other challenges for redundancy in the finance area where we have folks who are working a significant number of hours. We have overtime, very hard for somebody to take any vacation time. This position will provide us with important redundancy in that area. Um, also, a success story, uh, we have implemented the first of three major system changes that we have under our IT Forward project, uh, that being the meter data management system. Uh, that's been upgraded. We went live and knock on wood, we are doing well. Uh, our next major IT project is the CIS, uh, Customer Information Service, uh, our Customer Information System. And uh, we're looking to have a business analyst to work on that. And these are, in some cases, we're kind of bringing in-house services that we were consulting for uh, previously. And uh, we believe we have a better situation if we can have somebody in-house for that position. So that's what 12, 13, and 14 are related to. And, Hopefully that was a useful summary. I know it was a uh, you know, somewhat lengthy memo and packet, but those are the changes that we're seeking. Thank you, Derek. Questions or a motion? Councilor Brown. I just had a question about your ability to um, attract and um, hire uh, people for these positions. Are you, are you finding that it's just a dearth of Qualified candidates, or is it like the, the, the salary scales that they offer? I think our salaries are competitive. Um, in some cases, we've reached kind of a final point with a candidate for a position, and they prefer a position with more remote work. That's happened once or twice. Um, in some cases, we used to get five or ten qualified applicants, and now we might get one or two. So the pool of, of potential qualified applicants has been more limited. Um, and then in some cases, we're unable to attract someone for a position. Uh, we've lost in engineering a couple of really uh, you know, long tenured and, and well-qualified engineers uh, to outside consulting firms um, where they have potentially higher salary and less in-person work requirements. So there's it's a mix of things and it's the labor market more broadly. Um, How does that location yeah. factors as well? Yeah. So really we're, we're, I think we're operating under the assumption that we're going to have some vacancies. Um, it's built into our budget now. Um, it's built into our operational model. But there are some positions where having vacancies for too long a period are going to cause challenges. So I think we're, we're adding potentially some FTEs, but I don't think we're actually adding uh, to our overall count. In fact, I expect it's going to stay down for a period of time. But hopefully, uh, with some of these changes, we'll attract uh, new applicants for positions. Thanks. Thank you, Darren. Uh, any further questions? Ready for a motion? Councilor Jane. Yep. If the motion is not made, I would like to uh, the motion as indicated on board doc. Thank you, Councilor Jane. Do we have a second for the motion? Councilor Barlow, thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, we're now at 4.04, .04, which is a request to execute a contract with Michael and Valkenberg Associates for a phase two conceptual design and scoping at Grand Frank. And we have Smith have done to work on this to take this up. Hi, everybody. Um, I uh, have been in front of City Council a few times over the past um, month or two talking about uh, Moran Frame. So, every, hopefully, everyone is up to date on where things are at. I think the um, takeaway from the last couple of meetings was there's remaining money available um, from phase 1A and then uh, new money allocated for um, capital from the ARPA community infrastructure dollars. And so this uh, design contract would do the planning for the next phase of design 
um, focus of the Moran frame, but really um, about integrating the Moran frame and the whole northern waterfront into a cohesive um, place. So I'm happy to answer any questions people may have. Great, thank you, Samantha. Thanks for your work in advancing this project. Thanks. Um, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Jane. Yeah, um, I mean, I wanted to follow also the mayor a little bit, Samantha, and say that um, it's it's been maybe just a couple of years you joined the city. And I just wanted to say that I recognize the hard work you put into this. Thank because you. if it's not Board of Finance, you're on City Council, and also all the committees. <laughs> just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good work. It's only been... 18 months. 18 months. <laughs> okay. It only feels like years. Yeah. No. Thank you, Councilor Day, for, for oh, like 18 minutes. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> I'll just say I think this uh, design firm is very um, uh, exciting design firm to add uh, to the team here. They um, uh, have already. Did a little bit of um, conceptual work uh, already. They've been involved in some of uh, the, the, some of the most significant public um, parks projects in the country in recent years. And um, uh, got along, you know, I feel like from my perspective, we made real progress with, with Moran where it is now. Um, but I think to really realize the hopes and ambitions of this becoming an important gathering spot on the waterfront for future generations. Uh, it's going to need um, an inspired design to, to really accomplish that. I think that's what this will, uh, will, will give us. And I think with, with this contract, I'm quite optimistic about our ability to leverage other, other funds for a second phase from, from, from philanthropic uh, donors um, and potentially from other governmental entities as well. So, which is what we really need to do, right? We can, we, we have this about a million dollars carved out for a second phase right now. That won't get us too, too far. We need to inspire others to, um, uh, it's, to, to be part of a, of a second phase and this, uh, this, this country will really help us get there. That's what we get. I'm happy to make the motion that's recommended for us. Thank you. Second. Second by President Paul. Very good. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> motion carries announced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Next, do you have a parks and rec item? Um, uh, security waterfront overnight security contract. Welcome, Aaron. Hello. Why don't you give us a quick review of this? Sure. We're looking to convert what was a seasonal position at both the marina and the campground overnight waterfront security. Uh, you can imagine in the job market that it has been a tough position, a seasonal basis to recruit. So we are seeking the ability to contract with Green Mountain Concert Services to provide overnight waterfront security. Uh, we're gonna take the dollars that had been budgeted for seasonal staff um, to pay for this contract and we're not seeking any additional dollars. Simply summarize, thank you. Yeah. And we, uh, any questions for Aaron or are we ready for a motion? That's what we need. Quickly. Why well, can you describe like the hours that the security will be on site? Be constituting this overnight. Yeah, <clears throat> 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, overview. I'm happy to make the motion as recommended. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Mike. Council Barlow. Discussion. Vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Aaron. Good luck with the voting season, which is thank you. We're off to a good start. Yeah, great. Um, four over six. Uh, this is a Great Streets Main Street residential engineering outreach consultant authorization to award and design contract number seven. And we have Ben Laura here. It's an exciting sign that we're getting close to construction. So. Seniors, yes. you want to kick it off? Yes, we are. Uh, we're also joined by Maddie Sender, um, who is also helping us on this project. So yeah, as the mayor indicated, we are approaching the point in time where we're about to let out Main Street for contractor bid. Uh, tonight, we're asking for authorization to bring on inspection services, uh, more of a full-time construction outreach role that's underneath that. Uh, it's important to bring this group on before we actually put out the contract to bid because they are going to help us with some of the quality control and assurance of reviewing the plans uh, and answering and addressing any constructability questions that a contractor has. So similar to how it was done with the Champlain Parkway, how it was done with the Shelburne Street Roundabout, uh, this project of the same size and scale feels important to bring this group on at this point in time. As described in the communication, we are looking to award this to PIV Technical Services. They really stood out in the scoring as it relates to their experience. They were the inspectors on St. Paul Street. They've been the inspectors on numerous waterfront projects. Their outreach understanding of what Burlington uh, is looking for as a level and quality of assurance um, really stood out relative to the other proposers. Their number of hours that they were looking for in the project uh, was very reasonable and responsive. Um, whereas we felt some of the other firms that responded either had too little or too few. So that is one of the motions and actions that we're looking for tonight. The other is an amendment with our existing design consultant as we do look towards construction. Um, one of the things we wouldn't have known when we started and asked them to propose on the project is the length of time that Main Street um, could take to construct. And so we're looking to add scopes so that they can cover the amount of submittals, questions, be responsive to design changes, attend construction meetings. Um, so that brings forward an amendment to their contract. Um, as a quick update on that, you know, we are looking to bring the uh, construction contract or selection of the, cons the contractor to the city council, likely early meeting in September. Uh, with a tentative start of construction for November 1st. It's anticipated at this point, uh, likely a three year construction, working winters, working just daytimes, not weekends, and maybe maybe finishing sooner. And that is, uh, that's my item for today. Awesome. And uh, if you are here, I work on this. It's been a big left for a long time. It's exciting to sell the um, questions from the board. Or a motion. President Paul. I'm happy to see it moving forward. Um, and uh, I will not uh, doubt the recommended action, but just to say that I will move for the action. Thank you, President Paul. Do we have a second? Second by Councilor McGee. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. All right. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. 4.07 rubber removal for runway 1533. Actually, Bronson International Airport. Welcome to this. Rubber removal. Rubber removal. No, just I don't remember this. <laughs> um, so I'm here with uh, Dave Carmen, Deputy Director of Aviation Operations, and this is a pretty straightforward contract. Uh, this one happens to be for multiple years. So this will hit uh, this fiscal year as budgeted, next fiscal year as, as we proposed. It'll actually hit the following fiscal year and next year, uh, next year's summer months. Um, uh, all budgeted and uh, with some contingencies in there just for unexpected 
of Ensenal, what they have described the uh, technical sure. detail yeah. real quick. So what is is that every year, because we have so many you know, takeoff and landings, and when they land, they they deposit a certain amount of rubber on the street because that has to be removed. Otherwise, it obscures the center line, the markings on the runway, as well as decreases the braking action of the aircraft. So we have to mitigate that. And this rubber remo removal takes care of that. Uh, we have to do it roughly two times a year. So we put it in here as necessary. So we do have the option of not doing it uh, if we wanted to, but we wanted to make sure that it was in the contract. Another very good. Makes sense. Um, questions for the airport team or already promotion? I'm happy to make motions recommended by the board. Thank you, Councilor Barber. Second. Uh, second by Councilor King. Any further discussion? Councilor, you go ahead. Uh, just quickly, thank you both for the presentation. I wonder between this item and the next one, if this is something that the FAA helps cover because it's. Uh, they, they do not. Okay. Yeah, it's false. Any, any routine maintenance that the okay. FAA will not fund. Any big capital projects, uh, that, then yes, those are eligible items, but not routine. I mean, they don't fund directly, but I mean, the we do get revenues, FAA approved revenues, and some sort of PFC charges don't go towards this. No, those are not eligible towards this either. Yeah. Really, we got to like sell garage spaces. That's so. right. That's right. <laughs> Get rid of rubber. That's right. Uh, yeah, any of the other revenue sources, uh, concessions, garage, etc., would go towards this. Thank you. I'm happy to make the motion as recommended. Great. Thank you, Councilor Gee. Do we have a second? Uh, do we already have a motion? Yeah, I was just going to have a motion. Sorry. <laughs> Got to your question. Sorry about that. My fault. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Sorry, Councilor Jang. That was an aye from Councilor Jang. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, and that brings us to our last deliberative item. Um, right? Yes. Which is the authorization to execute a contract for the supply and installation of airfield, even marking the airport. Yeah. Um, quick summary on this one. Yeah, uh, again, very similar to the last one, very straightforward contracts uh, with Highlight. Um, uh, I don't know, they're Highlight Airfield Services. Uh, this is, uh, again, budgeted for this fiscal year. We do this every single year. The majority of our paint work is internal with our own team and our own equipment, but some of the very technical, very detailed uh, pieces uh, when we're talking details, we're talking, we have measuring tapes out there looking at every single line out there. And that's, a, that, and that's what this contract would consist of uh, for that maximum amount of $160,000 for this fiscal year only expected to be done prior to June 30th. Yeah, we do have our FAA inspection in the middle of July. That ha this has to be done by that inspection, which is, I think we have it in there as July 14th has to be done. Great. Um, any discussion, any, any questions on this? I just, I just had one question. It just like uh, the, the rubber removal, I understand that's like sort of an annual. Is this also like an annual? Yes, uh, that's continuous. Uh, because our window of, of painting is so short, you know, with winter going straight into, you know, only have a few months and we have the FA inspection, uh, we have to get ready for that. And it's also a compliance issue as well. It, it's it's a little different than street painting. There's very there's glass beads in it. There's a very specific specifications. So once a year there, a couple times a year for the rubber removal, like Dave said, if we need it. Okay. Good. Uh, Councilor Jane, you had a question? Yes, very quick one. And I noticed in both memos, both of these contracts are currently actually happening right now, right? You have a contract with them. Uh, not a signed contract yet. Yes. Yeah. So basically, I'm like, we are almost at the end of this fiscal year, and it's now that we're voting on um, this contract. It's like kind of what I'm asking, and why is that? Like, sorry. yeah. So we, yep. The timing is essential. So we can't do this too early in the season. Uh, we also have to program or schedule this with 
these contractors to be very particular based on weather, temperature, eating, et cetera. Um, we were planning on doing a, a, as much painting as we possibly can. This painting and the rubber removal is something that we can't do in-house, but this painting uh, is really um, outside of the realm and the timing of what our team can accomplish prior to that FAA inspection. We don't necessarily know when the FAA inspection is every year. Generally, it's in the summer months. So this is this is why we want to get this done in the month of June, uh, just prior to our peak season, which we're headed into right now, peak season meaning in number of operations, getting out on the runway overnight. So it's a little bit uh, warmer temperatures overnight, but not as busy uh, operationally to, to impact any operations. So it's, it's yeah. all about that timing to get this contract. And just right. To add to that too, we can't paint if it's under 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So at night, even it's tough to, to get out there and do that, that painting. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for a motion on the set? I would like to move the motion as indicated on the board document. Excellent, thank you, Councilor Chang. We have a second. Second by President Paul. Any further discussion? We'll go to vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. All right. Uh, the you. motion carries unanimously, and we have completed the deliberative agenda. We still have a major item. So we have two more items to deal with tonight. One is a, um, a summary and update on the budget, uh, and then we will have a quick discussion. Of, um, and Brian, if you weren't planning, were you planning on staying for the whole budget anyways? Well, I'm just doing the BCBC part. So we, I, well, I would yeah. be happy to, here's what I would propose if the board is metal of this. We have Brian come and give this informational update about BCBC, which should be very quick. And mm -hmm. then I think we should take a short recess. We've been going for a couple hours and then we'll come back into the, the budget presentation. Well, I think we should make it wait. <laughs> <laughs> I burned it. <laughs> that was nice. Kind of made you make a long time. Sorry, I didn't see this. I didn't see that. I see that. See that. Um, it's been a long time since we've talked about BCDC. So, why don't you give us all, and you guys, believe it or not, you are, I believe, all elected duly like officers of BCDC. You are ex officio and voting members. Of the board of the Borough City Community Development. Let's can you give a little summary of what that is. Sure. Right? It really has been years since we talked about it, and uh, yeah, a summary of what's coming. So I mentioned recently that CEDO is just celebrating 40 years this month, but BCBC actually has a year was created a year before CEDO in 1982. Believe it or not, is that right? Um, I don't know who came up with the idea. I think it was Bernie's way of working around the fact that. City Council's Board of Aldermen was not going to create a CEDO at first. They said, no, we don't want to do that. So they somehow created BCDC. I got the council to do it. I persuaded them that it was the right thing to do, ultimately because it was a uh, way for the city to make strategic investments to promote community and economic development. It was a way for the city to move nimbly and quickly to buy property, um, be able to sell property in order to advance the city's goals. And so it was a um, not an unheard of way for a municipality to, um, to really you know, play a more activist role in building and sustaining a strong local economy. So BCDC was created. The bylaws um, are pretty straightforward, but they do say the Board of Finance is the board corporation. Um, and uh, it is customary for the legal services to be provided by an outside council, not by a member of the city's legal team. Um, we've had various um, attorneys over the years serve in that role. We were just informed by the most recent attorney for BCDC, Kathy Bow, that she's kind of winding down and doesn't want to take it on, but she had some suggestions for names. That's one of the things that you all will need to do and we will do the late work. Typically, CEDO staff, usually the director and one other staff member, work with the clerk treasurer's office on BCDC matters. Um, 
we have a, um, you know, I think during COVID, the board did not meet and so did not meet and uh, did not satisfy the requirements of the Secretary of State, but they've been very forgiving about that during the COVID period. And now that we're on the other side of that, um, it seems like a good time to, to kind of revitalize, rejuvenate the BCDC. Um, as, as I'd like to just tell you quickly uh, what we'll be looking to do um, at the annual meeting, which um, I think your minutes, your agenda says, shoot aiming for something like July, uh, June 12th, is what you're looking for. Um, and that's fine. I will be um, on the other side. I'll be, I'll be in Europe on a family trip. So I won't be here, but Samantha will, and she's prepared to, to walk you through. She's very connected to what BCDC um, owns for property and what those assets are and what some of the development opportunities with those assets present. Um, the, um, oh, I should have mentioned that the, the mayor, I think by, by the bylaws is the president of the BCDC. So that's one of the things that you all um, will work with and you'll elect officers at your annual meeting. Um, special meetings occur sort of on an as needed basis. That is usually when there's business that the city feels uh, needs to be brought before the board, uh, we'll, we'll do that. Um, just as a quick overview, properties that are owned by the BCDC. Um, I wish Nick Longo was here so we could hear this. We're hoping that the Ash building is, is a transaction that occurs because we, the BCDC, borrowed the funds and hired the development company to develop this building, which Heritage Aviation needed at the airport because the airport just didn't have the bandwidth. And they didn't have, they weren't in great place to do it at the time. Um, so, um, it was BCDC that owns that building and we lease it from the airport. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for BCDC to continue owning it. Um, so we're looking at a transaction where the airport would buy it from BCDC for the fair market value. The other one is 68 Sears Lane. Some people may remember there was a project down there called the Multimodal Transit Center, the South End Multimodal Transit Center. The project never came to fruition. Um, it's a property that Santa can explain in more detail, but we still owe money on that property. So um, that one is um, one that will also be discussed as a potential sale. Um, and in this case, it would be as part of the redevelopment of the adjacent parking lot that the company called Ride Your Bike, which is a Mula affiliate homes. And this would be thinking is this would allow for us to ensure that uh, CHT is able to build some housing there. Our goal being perhaps uh, one initial goal being for home ownership is our, something we're really focused on since there's so little of that. Um, lastly, we own a garage, believe it or not, at Westlake, which is really very creative way to get a garage built in a project that was very challenged at the time. Uh, the condominium portion, you may recall, was built around the time of the Marriott courtyard, but just after the courtyard. And Basically, they couldn't. They couldn't borrow. They they borrowed all they could to build the condos. They couldn't borrow any more to build a garage, but they needed a garage. So they came to the city, and BCDC borrowed the funds to build that garage. So a little we're known, but now we're in bid. We're coming out of the day where we be. Yes, it's, it's a little further out than we thought. We thought it was in twenty twenty five. We did a little research, and it looks like it's twenty twenty seven. So there may be it may be worth talking about. Some slightly discounted price on that if we want to try and do the transaction sooner. But they're basically they're obligated to buy it for a fixed price that's spelled out in the agreement. So they will either buy it for that price in 27, or if the city wants to entice them to buy it sooner, they lower the price a little bit. So okay, great. We'll be coming back. Um, Smith will carry the torch that night. Councilor Marley, go ahead. Hey, it's, it's so odd that this is here tonight because I've been looking at um old board of finance meeting agendas. I see this piece of PC and I was wondering what if I had it on my list to ask you. So, you, those are my right, no, you, you, must know. you must know that I still would be very interested to see the bylaws and oh, yeah. the list of properties and understanding the mechanics of how it works. City market wouldn't be it wouldn't be here if it weren't for BCC. But BCC owned that property because 
the, the, when the police department left, the city was not interested in holding on to a property that it thought might have some environmental liability. So BCDC took it on instead, <laughs> held on to it, and just kids carrying costs for years until they got city kept it. So, yeah. so this is available uh, to do projects. No, I mean, you know, it's the documentation. Of yes, it's all there. Yes, it's, it's all because available. Because it's so old, the bylaws, like some of that was hard to find. I'm going to send it to you now. You're going to be like, is this the real document? Because it, it looks so old and it's typewritten. Yes, it is. Um, but then Samantha and I, I don't have the complete list of properties, but I'm sure she does. So we'll send you the bylaws now. And then before the 12th, we can get you the rest of the items. Because yes, I don't think no one's trying to be opaque, okay, but because of the transitions of staff and not meeting, um, it's taken a while to assemble all this together. And now we want to be very transparent and have all of us on the same page. So it's a good question. That's awesome. Thank you. That was really the extent of my thing. Do we have a time for the meeting on the 12th? It will be part of the Board of Finance meeting. At the beginning or That's end. my understanding. Correct. And if we need to move that because you can't be here for the 12th, that's still on Thanks. Um, I will not be I will I will not be at the meeting on the 12th of June. Just a few. Uh, but do want to also mention that I think. You know, in fairness to uh, over the years that I've been on the council, I don't think that the CDC has really ever gotten like, attention to just groups. You know, people don't know. And most of the meetings, I have to I have to tell you, I mean, even when I was on the board of finance years ago, I mean, most of these meetings were done like a sort of an afterthought. People were racing to get up the stairs, you know, for council meeting. And it just never really got a lot of attention. And yet, as you point out, City Market is, you know, our beloved City Market, it's BCDC. So it, maybe it would make sense that, um, I mean, again, I won't be here on the 12th, but maybe it would make sense to spend a little bit of time going over what it really is so mm -hmm. people really do understand and I had forgotten about the fact that we haven't had a meeting um, in a couple of years, which also doesn't help in terms of visibility. But um, but we'll do that. We'll do better. So um, I just think it would be, it might be good to for everyone to know, not just the board of finance, yeah. even though we are the BCDC board. I think it would be great for others to know as well. And it's not obligatory to hold your meeting in June. It's okay. it was just sort of. Traditionally, it was like May, June, yeah. it was like the annual meeting time, but you could move it into July if you wanted to. If everyone would be here, I know I'd be here. Thank you. I would feel fine. We'll be here in July. Yeah. So, okay. Sounds like we could get some right work. So, um, we'll push it up to the next uh, early, early July one. Um, so, I would have to. Just Meeting July the 24th, it's the 17th. So, probably the county board of finance meeting. Yes, it is July 17th for board of finance. Unless others can't be here. Yeah. Um, so, you're wrapping up? I am wrapping up. Yes. So, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's enough on that. There's a preview. Catherine will send out some information. We have some decisions coming up. Interesting, positive decisions. Um, that uh, I think BCDC, as we talked about a little bit in the CEDO, um budget presentation, we are looking for ways, particularly to kind of community works part of CEDO to um, be. Uh, income generating self sufficient BCDC finances offer some some opportunity for that. So, to be continued into either uh, it looks like probably the July meeting. Um, okay, um, I uh, I am going to use a program of chair say let's take a five minute break and we'll be back at seven ten and restart for the budget presentation. I think we are ready to restart. True five minute recess. Um, and 
Um, Council Jang, I'm not sure if you're hearing, if you're hearing us. Uh, we are trying to complete this in, in about 20 minutes. So, um, I um, I'm gonna let you kick it off, Catherine. I'll inter interject as uh, as needed. Not as needed. That sounds about right. <laughs> um, so uh, this is an update to um, our conversation on May 8th, which doesn't seem that long ago. In May in the city, that's like three years, because as you know, we've had many marvelous nights of May um, since then, and everyone's been working hard on a balanced budget. Um, just a little bit of context here. Um, I referenced in early May, um, I presented to this group that our budget still had a $5 million budget gap. That was for three main reasons increased public safety personnel costs, a um, million dollars of fleet costs, and then the rest of that money is due to COLA increases for the other staff, non-public safety staff, and then all of the general inflationary pressures that come in environment when inflation is over 8%. Um, we have had our five marvelous nights. You all have provided um, detailed feedback um, on many parts of the budget. And based on that, um, I have worked with department heads to make sure we have answered your questions, given you information and integrated that feedback into the budget all while working to address the $5 million gap, utilizing the budget principles we discussed on the 8th. So where does that leave us? It leaves us here. Um, the proposed budget is just over, uh, this is general fund. Everything I'm gonna talk about tonight is we're focused on the general fund. And it is, uh, it has landed just over a hundred million dollars. And as you can see, that is just about a 3% increase over the FY23 amended budget. This is a slide that we shared with you on May 8th. So I'm not gonna go over it, but I am using it here because we framed the challenge um, and then we'll go through how we're proposing um, the, the solutions for each of these. Um, but as we talked about, we have vehicle costs, increased BPD and fire costs. And then we have, of course, costs for the rest of the staff. Um, we also talked about these sort of major elements of the solution, and these still stand. Um, we are using one-time funds to address the fleet challenge. The one thing that has changed on this slide is just a slight adjustment to these numbers. Uh, it's 400,000 from the unassigned fund balance and 600 from other one-time sources. Uh, the use of the council charter authority, uh, raising an additional 1.1 million, repurposing both ARPA as well as other reserves to the tune of $1.75 million to help with the public safety costs, using um, the BPD rebuilding reserve that city council created last year. That was taking unused uh, BPD salary costs from FY22. We saved them. We thought we would need them this year. We managed to kind of um, skate by without them, but we project needing that money for next year. And on top of all that, we made a bunch of additional cuts and adjustments. Then, unfortunately, um, we did, my office found some errors at the very end of last week in 
health and liability insurance budgets. Um, this was uh, an unfortunate surprise. Um, and given that it happened at this late date, um, the proposed solution is to use 500,000 from the assigned fund balance that is specifically for insurance. Um, and then to cover the rest, 400 from the unassigned fund balance. Can I just ask you? So, of the, course. So, the error identified is $900,000? Yes. Um, what we found um, is that the health insurance had not been, um, frankly, the staff in my office and the CT office had not adequately updated the health insurance for the employer portion of that budget since FY22. <clears throat> and so there was actually a larger than a $900,000 increase. Some of that we were able to figure out a way to absorb. Um, I have already put into place like how that won't happen again. Um, I realized that with some previous staff in the CT office that um, there was not the detailed level of budgeting that I would expect from professional staff. And so I've gone through with the staff I'm working with this year and reviewed every single salary increase, health insurance at a very um, detailed minute level. So, so what was the what was the total amount of the, of the error? The health insurance increased from thirteen point three million to fourteen point nine million. It was a one point six million dollar increase. It was it was not previous not anticipated. anticipated. Correct. And so over the course of last week, we did everything we could to figure out how could we, frankly, not come back to you and say, first we said the hole was this, then the hole was this, then the hole is that, um, to absorb into what we already had as a whole, as much of that as possible. This is what was not possible without um, needing to cut significant staff, excuse me, or services. Okay, I mean, I don't want to miss, I don't want to interrupt your presentation. No, okay. I, I, I mean, this is to me deeply, deeply concerning. Yes. And, and makes me wonder mm -hmm. what, what else there may very well be out there um, at this point when we're talking about just a couple of weeks before the budget is due. So, so this brings the gap that we're trying to fill from five to almost six million. That or is more. that is correct. Um, going back to the um, challenge that we knew about. Um, I'm happy to go back and revisit. I'm just going to keep us moving at this point. Um, the $1 million for vehicle fleet costs, um, we have looked at something like this before. Um, you can see we are asking for $400,000 from the unassigned fund balance, and there's about $600,000 from other sources, including the sales um, from fleet that is un, you know that we're done using, as well as the end of a fleet reserve and some impact fees. In over the next year, the fleet committee will also be working with a consultant on a comprehensive fleet management plan, and part of that plan will include. Um, how we stabilize that funding. As we talked about, 
uh, fleet needs a million dollars this year, next year, and two million dollars moving forward. Is there anything we can do to um, streamline that, reduce our costs, and how do we ensure that we have a source for them that money? For our increased uh, police costs, uh, I mentioned that we have $750,000 that was set aside for a police rebuilding fund. Um, we are proposing using 500,000 of that um, towards these salaries. 250,000 of that has been earmarked for um, a recruiting firm um, that Chief Murad has been in here talking about before. Um, and then to make up the difference, uh, we've spoken about using 1 million of the $2 million that was set aside for FY23's ARPA revenue replacement reserve. We only anticipate needing 1 million of that so 800,000 uh, would go to police personnel costs. But we know this is also an ongoing issue. Um, it's a multi-year challenge. And um, as you can see here, the FY24 personnel costs are up by $1.2 million. Um, but in FY26, when we're projecting a stabilized police department, um, that it is going up another $1.6 million. So we need to have um, a plan and conversation about how we will pay for all of that. We intend to do that um, before the end of the calendar year. Can I ask you why? Um, why FY25 is missing? Um, because we, I don't know the level at which it will, what will happen in FY25 and what will happen at FY26. What I was doing was um, going from where we are in FY24 to a stabilized budget, and we don't expect that in FY25. Okay. It's a little confusing, but All right. thank you. Thanks. Uh, we also have almost a million dollars of increased personnel costs in fire. Uh, so we have the other 200,000 of the ARPA revenue replacement allocated here, as well as money from the assigned fund balance um, that was set aside for potential initiatives that is no longer needed. Um, we have already agreed during the bargaining process with the fire union to hire a consultant to understand what staffing resources we need in our fire department and the option to cover those costs. The RFP is out. The uh, committee is reviewing those responses now, and you should be hearing more about that effort shortly. Um, there are other, these other COLA increases that I mentioned, um, and this is where uh, we're targeting the adjustment to the parks appropriation, and there are several other cuts and adjustments. I haven't listed them all, but this is a selection of them. Um, thanks to our friends at DPW, Chapin's still here, um, for both um, willingness to uh, discuss moving some salaries to capital, an increase in um, parking meter revenue, and one of the items we discussed previously um, due to an administrative error, our water resources department overpaid their pilot in FY22. And um, we owe them a credit. Um, Megan has talked about this. That credit is part of what is helping her to afford some of her new staff. Um, but she has gracefully um, 
agreed to let us uh, have that, to push that credit um, so that half of it, the remaining half will be this year and then half in FY25. Um, we also in discussions with CARA are suggesting a $100,000 reduced appropriation to ELI. Um, the ELI staff is actually not able to spend their money every year. Um, and that was before uh, the projected large increase in state funding. Um, and then we also have two other cuts here. Um, I've worked with Cindy and the parks team um, on a series of small cuts in several areas, all leading to $100,000. And then a $50,000 cut to the consulting line for planning. Megan does not need it in FY24, but wants to make sure it's available for future years in FY25. So we would want to keep that in mind. There are some remaining issues. Um, we are still reviewing some personnel cost assumptions. Um, we are making sure we've talked about some proposed revenue studies here, and I'll talk about a couple of more and want to make sure there's a funding source for all of them. And we spent a lot of time on the general fund budget, so making sure our capital and all of our non-general fund budgets are getting ready too. Uh, an important slide for everyone, the proposed municipal tax rate. Um, you will see it's just over a 5% increase. Um, that includes two important items I want to draw your attention to. Um, in the rates capped by voters section, smack in the middle, is um, the tax called street capital and green belt. In FY23, it was five cents. And um, we, it was our intention in FY23 that everything had been restored to the maximum under those rate, rates capped by voters. Street capital and green belt is the most complicated of those taxes. And it has come to our attention that there is more room, that tax, the cap is actually 6.17 cents. And so after feedback we've heard from this council about how important paving work is, um, it is our recommendation that we add a half a cent to the five cents. And so you'll see the recommendation there is 5.5 cents. That does allow about 500,000 or 500,000 of uh, additional money that goes directly to street capital that would allow for additional patching. Before I speak to that, Tim, Sure, and we've you know, been working with the administration, looking at what that additional uh, work would be. It'd be about an additional half mile of paving or very substantial patching. We'd like to pave because it's a more durable fix than a patch, which is not as durable. Uh, based on our pavement uh, prioritization right now, we have a draft that shows the next street on the list would be Stanford Road from North Avenue to Oakland. And um, that is our initial thought, but we're gonna need a little bit of time, but it's about a half mile of additional paving in addition to the 1.3 miles that's under contract for this year. Great. So this is, you know, we're interested in the board's thinking on this. This, this came, you know, Catherine mentioned it in my the discussion that we had about uh, paving concerns in the, in the prior, Budget discussion as well as there has been um, MPA discussion surging or here. So do you have the capacity here with our authority to do it? It does add um, uh, it does take us from what just under five percent of an increase we talked about last time to just under six. So that um, that's the change. Nothing else about the tax the tax 
vaccines has changed since the last time we talked about that. Uh, the, okay. the only other thing to note here is that we are in the midst of um, a plan to phase out our business personal property tax, um, but that hasn't happened yet. This budget does include raising the exemption for that tax from 45,000 to 75,000 to get us uh, closer. That rate has not been raised to keep up with inflation. And this starts us on that path. Just to say a little bit more about the, the history there, this actually went to the voters back in, what was it? Some, uh, 2019. 2019. Um, which, uh, and voters approved the phase out of this tax, which is, Brunton is fairly unique in the state at this point, just about the only community to be charging this tax. Um, and there's also, we can get into some of the details of this if we need to, but to spare you them for a moment, um, there's a big push around the state to remove this tax, and we made that decision, um, and the voters approved that decision uh, in 2019. The phase out was supposed to happen. Um, we uh, increased the exemption to 45,000. It was the first step in that, uh, or it wasn't that we increased the exemption, but we made the exemption apply to, it had been sort of applied in a funky way previously. So we made it universally apply to all taxpayers. Then um, there was another sort of step towards the phase out that was contemplated in the charter change when we did the reappraisal in that it was um, expected that that, um, the, that that would result in um, less of the revenues. It, it basically was anticipated that there would be uh, a, a, some reduction of the tax with the reappraisal. Um, let me come back to that point in a moment. And the third point of the phase out is it, at the, um, and I get confused on exactly the date, but I believe it's the end of calendar year 25. The, the, uh, the, the tax goes way per the charter change. Um, we, the charter change gave the city council the authority to take further steps towards phasing it out if um, prior to that deadline, if we, we have the authority to do that. Uh, we don't, we're not compelled to do it until the end of uh, 25. Um, then what further happened is there's been a very substantial increase in investment um, that gets taxed by the business personal variety tax. So we have secured, we have gotten significantly additional revenues that were not anticipated in this phase out plan. And, um, uh, and there has been quite a bit of communication to me and several other counselors of a desire to um, you know, a concern that at least there be some adjustment, and this essentially does adjust this uh, exemption for inflation. Um, that's how we sort of got to this, and um, there had been a desire to have the exemption go even further, but um, in light of the challenges, uh, I, I don't see a way to do that. I do think uh, an adjustment for inflation, given the history of this item, is appropriate for us to consider. So, and that revenue impact of that in capital is about $100,000. So that's, that's the full tax decision. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the FY24 budget proposes $800,000 from the unassigned fund balance. Um, so I wanted to be very upfront about how we are doing with that, what our balance is today, which is just over the 10%, and what our new balance would be if we committed that $800,000. And also to let you know that that balance does not include um, what would still be left even if we uh, used some of the money we are proposing in the reserves for insurances, we'd still have 500,000 left for health insurance, also 500,000 for liability. And it's not $250 for snow reserve. Lucky for Chapin, it's 250,000 for snow reserve. I just left off the K. That sounds more accurate. <laughs> 
Um, our next steps to pass the budget, we won't spend much time here because everyone here in this room, I think, knows these dates. Well, one thing we should talk about is, it's just, we should, before we bring up today, let's talk a little bit about the dates, but um, uh, and just whether um, we should be counting on the 2.6 day or not. But let's um, maybe, well, we're make sure that maybe let's open up for discussion um, questions on uh, the presentation tonight. All right, last slide, then we'll open it up. Um, we don't expect these budget challenges to go away magically at the end of this year. And this year, this budget's reliance on cuts and one-time funding is not sustainable. Um, we've talked in this meeting and others about a lot of these revenue and operational studies that are happening. Um, we've listed them here, uh, their fleet management, the urban three revenue and equity analysis, the fire staffing and the impact fee study. Uh, we also are working closely with the capital committee and fleet committee to meet the city's needs in those areas before a new bonding capacity becomes available. Uh, we are looking at non-property tax sources of revenue and how we may increase or expand franchise fees and pilot. Um, and we've talked certainly about the need uh, to develop a multi-year plan to pay for expanded public safety. And then lastly, with a budget this tight, um, we are having a lot of discussions internally about how we will continue to monitor personnel expenses to ensure a balanced budget and reporting out to this body. And with that, we are done. Anything you'd like to add, Mayor, before we open it up? Uh, just um, we should add to the, the budget memo. We'll wait a sec, but there's also <laughs> another study that we've already committed to making plans for. Uh, I forgot to remind you earlier that the, the CEDO uh, is doing a yes. management uh, analysis to really focused on. Uh, on their, their financial sustainability, particularly when the community works uh, part of CEDA. So, um, okay, with that, uh, questions, discussion? That's what we need. I just, on the um, street capital, yeah. Yeah. that was at first glance, I'm not supportive of that. I know the need is there. Um, but considering the ASCO when they do with the rate parks tax and other rate increases that uh, Burlington residents are going to be facing in the coming fiscal year, I don't feel comfortable supporting that right now. Um, and yeah, unless we can find other funds to. Maybe shift the other tax increase, but that's my initial take on the new information. It's helpful to that. That's where I um, I had I had some questions from earlier in the presentation. The BPD rebuilding fund is that the um, retention and then hiring bonus fund, or is that it is separate? It's separate. Fund. Yes. And we still have money in the retention and hiring fund. We had established them at the same time, but as separate funds. This is essentially, Council Barlow, the half million that we put into the budget in anticipation of um, the contract increase that we did. You know, if you recall, we were sort of doing this sort of dance of like not knowing exactly where the contract was going to land trying to be a little bit strategic about how we showed it in the budget, given that it was still under negotiation. And so we had sort of a lump sum in the rebuilding plan because we considering the contract to be an important part of the rebuilding was the thinking at the time. And, um, and then we did, in fact, as you all know, um, support a substantial uh, increase, but 
basically the way um, the budget is coming in for the year, you, even though that was sort of put in there to pay for the COLA increase, we're not needing to, to use all of it. Um, so it's still still there, uh, uncommitted. And so um, in this you know, multi-year plan to phase into these uh, in increased public safety costs, um, we're relying, as we've talked multiple times, relying heavily on one-time costs uh, for this year's portion of it, this is a one-time cost of funds that were set aside for police. Uh, we're just kind of taking it for one part of the police budget um, and we'll be uh, repurposing it for this sort of one-time purpose. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that clarification is so, helpful. Um, and then I had a, a sort of a question. I think maybe this has been asked, but um, the parks tax, which I also share uh, former Council Bushers concern about this. Um, I also recognize that we're in very challenging times right now. Um, but I'm sort of trying to quantify it a little bit more precisely. And I'm wondering, um, like, how much of a tax increase, just the increase on the, the parks uh, specific portion? It's about, like it's about half of uh, the, separate from the media. Yeah, I don't give you the exact figure, but it's basically of the almost 5% of which is two cents of the dollar at about half of two and a half percent of the five percent. So, uh, so like I, I got a median price tell on like how much I see it would be uh -huh. as we, as we, uh, we can give you that. Yes, yeah. that'll take a little bit longer, but yeah. yes. And I'm not asking for it now, but yep. if you're gonna like, uh, yes. communicate, people are gonna be wondering how it's gonna affect yeah. their property tax bills. Yeah. Um, and then my, my other uh, question was around um, increasing street capital, which I am extremely supportive of. I think if it's any, if we do anything as a city, that's one of the basic sort of expectations of at least my constituency that I hear about on a regular basis is the streets. Um, and I understand the, dur the, the argument around it's more durable to pave. Um, Half mile, but how much how much patching could we do for the same half million dollars? Uh, it it depends on the dimension of the patches. Uh, there are a number of other streets that are high on the list. Uh, the north end of Walnut Street, uh, well, not Lowe's Terrace, uh, Linden Terrace, uh, and these are places that we could expand to if we did less uh, work on Stanford. So, this is all new that we've kind of talked this through. So we're, we're trying to bring you as much information as possible given the late date here, but uh, our final uh, additional work is not dialed in yet. We'd have to negotiate change order with the contractor, but uh, our intent is to, uh, you know, this if approved would add to the base funding year over year. The next couple of years will be exceptionally tight given that the 23.8, million dollar bond or sustainable capital funding fully utilized next this uh this coming year 25 sorry 25 will be the last year which means that ultimately um for 26 27 we're going to be exceptionally tight so having a larger base funding will be helpful for us to continue some level of capital reinvestment hope it's helpful And then, then just a couple of general sort of ideas, I guess, are for these um, beyond fiscal 24, you know, I'm wondering if we're thinking about ways to like study efficiencies within the sort of, you know, people structures we have in the city to try to squish out a little bit of um, expense. Um, I don't mean to imply that we kind of Compositions, but is there a way to get some efficiencies either operationally or otherwise? And then I'm wondering, in terms of our ability, our constraints, especially around street capital and some other things, is as as we better understand what the state contribution is going to be um, and other contributions for the Burlington High School project, how that frees up additional capital 
uh, debt capacity for the city to use for some of the important projects that we, we have on the site. And I, I yeah, as you discussed a little bit before, I think that that's hugely important and you know the 16 million that we just kind of vetoed, but it's over today's and the budget that ultimately passes. Um, that's you know that if, if the project stays on budget and that 16 million comes in and we get potentially significantly more, we're gonna be going for next year for um technical education funding. Um that uh we should be able to reduce that $165 million bonding. I do think that um, the way our MOU works with the school district and the way kind of the way we've sort of started our thinking on this, that that will, instead of us, if that were to happen, instead of having to wait all the way to FY30 to do for there to be untapped capacity, it could move it up um, maybe you know a couple of years, maybe three years. There, there's still, I think, going to be a, a significant period here unless something dramatically changes with that, which is unlikely, um, where we are, you know, where, where we're going to have, uh, like Jake was referencing before, some, uh, some, some real challenge sustaining the level of capital investment that we've seen in recent years, even as our aging infrastructure uh, gets worse. So that's why. Um, I think we're talking about that a lot in the coming year. Unfortunately, you know, we still have some of that bonding capacity left for FY25, so not you know, another decent year after this before we kind of hit that cliff. But I do think um, we have to think seriously. You know, we have to be as creative as we can about the years that follow. Um, I, I do think there's some interesting conversations to to have not that far. I mean, we're in this bind about our, our our borrowing until we get to a better place. Um, I do think once we get, whether it's 28 or 29 or 30, once we get there, we are going to be retiring substantial amounts of debt on an annual basis. And I think there's some interesting solutions to look at, you know, getting new authority that we don't currently have in the charter about um, reinvesting uh, when that kind of, you know, when we pay off debt, being able to uh, take on, make new investments without having to mobilize around these big boats uh, to, to do that. That might be a real change and allow us to be more systematic about how we make investments in the future instead of these big episodic investments. But kind of getting it like this is a, I think this is not a conversation we're going to fully have in the next few weeks on this budget, but it is my intention that we um, have a lot of that discussion now that our challenge is, is sort of clear with what's happened with high school over the last year and with, uh, with this budget. I think we are going to have a lot of kind of off budget season work to do um, to get, you know, we're, we're clearly straining to get through this one and at an acceptable levels in terms of taxation and, and uh, use of reserves. Um, we can't do this again next year. So we, we have the board finance has a big job ahead to kind of sort through all this in the area. Thanks. I, I do appreciate it. Yeah. I do think. From my perspective, I've always that the fact that this budget, whether we are at the 4.8% or 5.8%, it's still basically consistent with um, inflation, which, um, you know, I think we should can consider everything else in our lives is going up. I think people value the services the local government provides. Um, um, we we are really challenged. Our, our revenues do not increase with inflation, as we've talked about many times. Some of them do, but most of them, big, our biggest revenues do not go up with inflation unless we take a step like this. So this is where, now that we're in this high inflationary environment, um, uh, I think we're really feeling the effects of that. We're also feeling the effects of, you know, not succeeding with the, uh, the proposed increase uh, last year. Um, that would be a, a pretty different place we'd be in had that tax tax increase gone gone through. So um, I do think it's important that we consider using that authority in, in, with in the parks budget, but we will provide the authority as you request. And you had asked a question that I'm not sure got answered about 
um, was there money or plans to study efficiencies? And this is something that Shapen and I are very passionate about slash nerding out about. There is money that was appropriated in FY last year, 23, under the CT budget called something like revenue efficiencies and something like that. And we're keeping, we've, the only thing to come out of that is the urban three study. Um, and part of the reason we, as we were trying to free up a lot from assigned fund balance, the mayor and I spoke and we thought like, that's the money we want to keep because that what we, we want to keep spending it on is looking at those efficiencies. And Chapin and I have discussed um, how we could roll that out. Um, there are some departments that are very eager for it. And I think we could use some um, discussion with council about how we might do that. But the very short answer is yes, that's on our minds. And the longer answer is we're figuring out how that might look. If you have ideas, I'd love to talk to you offline. Good. All right. All right. Okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Can you see? But, um, go ahead, Councilor Mayor. Mayor. Mayor said you couldn't see because it's brown. It's. <laughs> Well, <laughs> okay um yeah thank you um if i hear it very correctly is it seems on in addition to the 1.1 million four parks right that we considering there is also an addition of five five point eight uh percent property tax request no no okay. that's not quite right thank the, you. the the um, we have, we are sticking with our recommendation that's been consistent throughout this last couple months here, or since, you know, since beginning of May, May at least, that we, um, we are projecting, I think the budget that I submit, um, in a couple weeks is going to likely include at least the four point. 8%, I think it was 4.8, uh, 4.9%. That is, that, that is the $1.1 million. The, the, it's about, about half of that is related to the $1.1 million in parks. The other half of that is the taxation levels that are a result of past decisions by the voters, by the council that we really don't have discretion over on an annual basis. The debt service, tax that we went to the voters in different votes and showed them how things were going to rise over time and those projections are consistent with what we're doing and then um uh and then the um the retirement tax which okay. is okay so we're at 4.8 percent about half of that for the parks which is discretionary okay One discretionary in the sense that it's a you know we could choose not to do it but we have to come up with another million dollars of, of cuts to do that. Excellent. What we talked about tonight would be an additional 1%, essentially additional half a million um, for uh, additional paving, which we do have the authority to do. And honestly, I'm um, a little bit on the fence about whether my budget will include that or not. I was looking forward to tonight's discussion and understanding okay. um, what, where, where counselors were going to fall on this, but I thought we'd be remiss not to talk about it, given the, um, you know, the, I agree with Councilor Barlow that there's a lot of desire for a strong paving. Stanford Road is in terrible shape right now. It's embarrassing. Um, uh, there are other other streets that are really in, in, in rough shape. And um, so we could invest more. We have to at least consider it. But I've heard Councilor McGee, um, voice some concern about it. So I am curious what you think of that, Councillor Jagan. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. And I think throughout the discussion about the budget, I have been consistently saying, let's identify ways where we can find the, um, you know, the park budget. Let's call it that. Um, let's just identify it. And I see as part of this presentation today that some efforts were made, but still it's not uh, significant, right? And my biggest concern now about this budget is the unassigned fund balance is no longer healthy. 
we have used this 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 budget decision we 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 have tapped a lot into it you know without putting any but we 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 decreasing it um yes and i think also with these rate increases it's it's an issue too um across the board from both water um and electricity and also we need to think about as much as the city as an entity is touched by the inflation inflation i mean i believe that it it is touching the people at a greater rate like more impactful on them um and we have also made significant amount of investment around this high school coming up and i think uh, former councilor busho um said it right um we, we we anything we said it's an addition and i i am i'm concerned just like uh, maggie about about any tax increases this year from the city right that's exactly where i am and i know that if you put some emphasis into it there will be able um, you'll be able to identify more ways to 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 provide the basic services and still not tax people in this 24 2024 budget now my other question is specific to uh, director spencer and um you know just what you're considering as well and just to try to understand the work contract currently happening in the city is it on both the roads and sidewalk is it from the fy22 budget paying for it have we actually used fy2023 budget yet for construction currently taking place right now just before you answer that question sure um, i do just want to not I, I think it's important to respond to Councilor jang to the notion that that the unassigned fund balance would not be healthy with the passage of, of the budget as we're talking about it here. Um, the what um, I, I want to make sure our slide was clear here that we would still have a greater than nine percent um, explicit unassigned fund balance, um, and in addition to that, we would have these major reserves for another million dollars, more than another million dollars, which would uh, we have not formally count, we don't formally count that in the, in, it is not part of our undersigned fund balance percentage. It is an additional reserve that, um, for really three of the expenses that have the kind of most variability from year to year. Um, and so, uh, that combination of the 9% unassigned fund balance plus another million dollars of reserves, I just want to be clear, it's vastly greater reserves than the city ever had until we developed the reserve policy in 2018. Um, and so, you know, to have still over $7 million in reserves or something, um, you know, really unexpected comes up is, is a quite um, healthy position to be uh, in relative to where we have been in the past and, and would we expect still be seen as quite healthy by Moody's in the in the credit rate evaluation. So I just I, I don't disagree that I don't, you know, we have we've had this informal, the, the, the policy said between five and 15% is is where we have to be. We've had this informal target of trying to keep it around 10%. And I'm satisfied that we're still essentially at that target with what we're talking about here. Uh, given these other reserves, I, you know, I, which is not, which, which is, and I agree with you, Councillor Jang, that, um, you know, this is the, over, looking ahead, we are not, we need to find future budgets. This is, uh, that have less use of, of one-time funds. So, um, I think it could become unhealthy if we don't do something about it in future years, but I, I don't. One, I think it's important to recognize that that's still a very healthy level of reserves going into the upcoming year. Okay, thank you. Over to you. To you. Yes, Council Jack, quickly, uh, calendar year 22 sidewalk budget or contract is wrapping up. There is one street, uh, I think, remaining Prospect Hill. Uh, there is one street on calendar year 22 paving, Birchcliff Parkway that is still under construction. Our contracts for calendar year 23 have been signed and work uh, is uh, 
underway or about to get underway with paving and sidewalks. Uh, so all of the work is under contract and is progressing. Some of the work in calendar year 22 did bleed over to spring of 2023. Thank you. Happy to talk more and more detail offline. Sounds good. There's one more issue to get feedback and, you know, it's getting really late. I want to let people go. I do just want to go back to the calendar issue um, and get a sense for uh, what the board is thinking at this point. We, um, I, I believe we have surfaced almost all, you know, we have surfaced the major issues that uh, are, are in this budget. We will be, um, uh, and, and you've seen departmental budgets that things are not going to change dramatically from what we've discussed from here. We will be bundling this all up in, and when we meet on the 12th of June, we will have a full, uh, all one time budget. Um, assembled for, for that meeting. We'll have a moment, we'll have a night for any final input. Um, you'll be getting a major memo from me that week as well. Um, we have had years where on that, you know, that kind of timeline because of all the work we do together ahead of time that um, very quickly within days, uh, you know, we will submit the budget formally on the 15th, but it will have a lot of information that's very consistent with what you've had up until now. Some years the council has been, um, and I'm, I'm really not putting my thumb on the scale either way on this. I just want to kind of have a clear discussion about it. Some years we've uh, had the council has been comfortable taking the budget formally, and then just a few days later voting to, to act on it. Um, some years the council has wanted to take more time, and we do have that option available to us too. So the act on it immediately would be voting, working on it on the night of the 19th. Um, you know, final board finance meeting on the 12th, final input, formal submission on the 15th, vote on it on the, on the 19th. Um, the backup date or the other day, the other option available is to have a third June city council meeting on the 26th, and then you would have an additional week to, to review it before action. And um, I just thought it might be helpful for everyone's schedules if we had some sense, if you guys had any feedback on, on what you think you would like to, to do this year. That, that's why it sort of said it has needed on that slide. Uh, I just, I wonder when do we have to make that decision? I mean, you don't really have to make the decision until the, you know, until the 19th, you can decide we've had years where we have it on the agenda and then the decision is made to wait a week. Um, it, you know, if, um, I, I think there's been, there's some other thoughts of, uh, there was some talk of like a council retreat or something else on the 26th that we weren't going to have the, the, the budget book. So that, so for planning purposes, if there was a earlier indication, it might be helpful, but I can understand why it might not be possible to give an earlier indication. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, given some of the things that are still in the air, I'm probably going to wait until the June 12th board finance meeting before that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, saying definitively whether we need an extra week. That uh, that, that that resonates with me, um, especially you know, given with some of the conversations tonight, the fact that things have continued to move. So um, great. So we will that'll be less than two weeks from now. We'll have that meeting and we'll go from there. I am thinking unless there's anything else anyone is really. I just want to reiterate again, this is not the end of the discussion. If people have questions that we haven't had a chance to answer here, please reach out to us now. We will try to ha have an ethic of sharing the answers to any counselor questions from full council as they come in. And um, we very much welcome them. Thank you. All right. With that, um, if there's no objection, the Board of Finance is adjourned at 8 5 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for another marathon session today. Thank you. Thank you.